Welcome to another lesson by Mrs. M. Teaches English, in which I discuss a poem in the Grade 12 English Home Language IEB curriculum prescribed from 2020 to 2022. The poem is Mongani Wali Siroti's Lost or Found World, which was written in the 1970s during the apartheid era of South Africa. Have a look at the image which I have selected for the title slides. You'll see a fairly arid area with a signpost on which there are three choices of direction, lost, found, or searching. As we go through the poem, remember this image and the signpost. Try to think of possible links between the text and this image. As always, we start our study of a poem with some information about the poet himself. Sorote is a South African poet who was greatly affected by the unjust and discriminatory laws of the apartheid regime. This talented writer used his art form as a vehicle to express his concerns and anguish at the suffering of fellow South Africans during a very dark period in our history. He was himself arrested and confined under the Terrorism Act and was forced to endure nine months in solitary confinement. He was eventually released without charge. As so many prominent South African artists did, Sorotti left South Africa and spent many years in exile. Sorotti's writings has themes of political activism and the development of black identity. He often uses imagery related to violent resistance and revolution. In 1973, he was awarded the Ingrid Jonker Prize for Poetry for his anthology of poems entitled Yakaling Como, which means the cry of the cow. In Sorotti's own words, he explains what he means by this title, The Cry of the Cow. Follow on the slide as I read Sorotti's explanation. Dumile, the sculptor, told me that once in the country he saw a cow being killed. In the kraal, cattle were looking on. They were crying for their like, dying at the hands of human beings. Yakalin Como. Dumile held the left side of his chest and said, that is where the cry of the cattle hit him. Como. The cattle raged and fought. They became a terror to themselves. The twisted poles of the kraal rattled and shook. The cattle saw blood flow into the ground. I once saw Mankunkungosi blowing his saxophone. His face was inflated like a balloon. It was wet with sweat, his eyes huge and red. He grew tall, shrank, coiled into himself, uncoiled, and the cry came out of his horn. This is the meaning of Yakalinkomo. This cry of cattle as they are about to be slaughtered is what Sorotti captures in his writing. It is that cry of a suffering people, and he's able to skewer that pain onto paper in words. As we go through Lost or Found World, I think you'll develop an understanding of what Sorotti was saying about his fellow man, those that suffer and those who inflict suffering on others. It is interesting to note these words by another respected South African poet, Aesop Patel, who is also a High Court judge, who says of Sorotti's poetry, It is profoundly dedicated to the culture of the oppressed and exploited. It asserts the highest ideals of the revolution. The development of Sorotti's poetry is consonant with the momentum of the liberation struggle against apartheid. This, then, 
is the background of lost or found world. Patel went on to write that, in his opinion, Sorotti's poems deserve wider attention because of their intrinsic poetic range and quality, and not just because of their socio-political messages. In later years, post-apartheid, Sorotti was appointed to oversee the construction of Freedom Park, a monument in Tswane dedicated to honouring those who gave their lives for South Africa's democracy. You'll agree that it's fitting that a man who suffered much himself should be charged with honouring others who suffered for the same ideals. Before we grapple with the text itself, you should have a method of analysis. I tend to think in patterns, such as the spider diagram, but you should work out a method of gathering your thoughts and information in a structure that works for you. A useful acronym for the analysis of any text, including poetry, is SpaceCat. You can write notes under these headings. Who's the speaker of the poem? What's the purpose of the poem? For whom was the poem written? When was the poem written? Why was the poem written at that particular time? Did anything prompt the writing of this poem? What choices has the poet made in terms of technique and other linguistic devices? What appeals do you see in the writing? Does the poem appeal to your sense of logic or your feelings or your sense of right and wrong? What's the tone of the poem? SpaceCat is a very useful acronym to use when analysing any text. Remember it for paper one, especially when you read and understand the passages for questions one and two, the reading comprehension and summary questions. Let's get started with the poem itself. Sorotti is renowned for his use of powerful imagery. As I read the poem to you, try to visualize some of the images in the poem. Listen for skies of truth and the sea of identity. Picture what these look like. Try to get a sense of what verbal picture Sorotti was painting with his words. Lost or found world. Skies of truth on our scenes at the mercy of my curtain eyes. I wink often, more often, to draw the curtains, to cut and forget the skies. The sea of identity is tears. A too salty expression bleeding my blue veins, that's my pen, on the loose sand that shall sip, and the wind shall help cover it from the needy arteries. Mountains of hope are flowers, passes attracting cars like bees, for the precious modern honey, that is money. This modern madness snaps flowers from their stems, leaves dry dead bodies walking up the street. Old wishes is present deeds, bright with blinding for old, dark with wonder for the new, that's where we are, lost or found world. Don't worry if you feel a little bewildered after the first reading. It's an ambiguous poem and takes some time to unravel and understand. The most logical place to start is the title, Lost or Found World. I'm sure that in your school there is a lost and found box or room where you go when you have misplaced an item that belongs to you. But this poem is not entitled Lost and Found. It is lost or found. This small change ensures that the reader is aware of the ambiguity, the uncertainty of the title and the poem. By the end of the poem, You'll see that the speaker wonders whether his world is lost or found. 
it's clear that he experiences conflicting emotions. His world has either been lost, which implies failure and hopelessness, or it has been found, which implies success and hope. As we work through the material, consider what you find important. What could you lose or find in your own world? The first stanza presents a dreamlike scenario from the speaker's perspective. It appears that when he closes his eyes, he imagines or sees skies. The challenge for us, the readers of this poem, is that there are no real contextual markers. We cannot definitively state that this is a poem about apartheid or oppression or South Africa. We have to negotiate the universality of these images, which can be tricky as we all bring our own thoughts and senses into our readings of poems. My advice to you is to stick to the text, the words of the poem. The image that we are given in the first stanza is that of closing eyes, with the eyelids compared to curtains that are drawn shut. This metaphor could refer to window curtains or possibly the curtains on a stage. The speaker wishes to escape the truth and does so by closing the curtains, knowingly separating himself from this truth. Here we see a change from external ideas of truth to internal and subjective perceptions, which allows the speaker to focus on the idea of identity. Look at the progression of the actions in the stanza. He first winks to escape the skies of truth. Then he deliberately draws the curtains and then he forcefully cuts and forgets the skies. It's not clear what this truth is but it must be something so disturbing that the speaker chooses to escape from it rather than face up to it. I don't know about you, but I picture a man very deliberately closing the curtain on a window, choosing not to see what is outside. As the speaker closes his eyes or winks his eyes, he avoids seeing the skies of truth. These skies of truth are at the mercy of his eyes, because if he doesn't like what he sees, he simply closes his eyes. In a sense, he chooses to escape from the truth and not deal with it. Identity is likened to tears in line six. The sea is described as too salty, which we understand to convey that so many tears have been shed that the sea water is saltier than usual. The speaker's search for identity is painful, so painful that he has wept. In line eight, the speaker alludes to the feelings that he pours out on paper by writing. His writing is obviously deeply personal, as he bleeds his words on the paper. His blood is blue, not because of royalty, but because it's the color of ink. To continue with the sea and sand imagery, the speaker describes how his blood, his ink, drips onto the sand from his needy arteries. The ink or blood is absorbed by the sand. Note the alliteration, the sibilance of the S sound in loose sand that shall sip. This draws our attention to the liquid, the ink being absorbed by the sand. It's as though the writer's art is so painful that he bleeds into the earth. The speaker's words might be ignored, he feels, but he will not be prevented from writing. We see this in the reference to needy arteries. Arteries are the blood vessels that transport oxygenated blood from the heart to the rest of the body. Without this process, we would die. 
to a writer, the act of writing is a life-giving and affirming activity, even cathartic. Writing, expressing his emotions, is something that he has to do, even though confronting past and present trauma is so difficult. Writers need to write. The result of this is that the tone of stanza one is one of hopelessness. The speaker's words are being ignored, despite the obvious effort and emotions that are poured into the writing. If his writing is ignored, well, then his identity is threatened, even invalidated. In the third stanza, the sense of hopelessness created in the previous stanza is contrasted with mountains of hope. These mountains seem to be barriers between which cars pass for money. In this stanza, the speaker addresses a modern ill, our striving for material gain, our pursuit of that precious commodity, money, in the mistaken belief that it will provide happiness. Instead, this chase is a modern madness that snaps flowers and leaves dry, dead bodies walking up the street. Is the poet saying to us that in our modern madness, we become shells of the people we once were? We are the living dead, chasing something that will ultimately destroy us. In contrast to the greedy seashore, which sips the tears of the viewer's identity, hope is described in terms of natural metaphors, which support life. Flowers are pollinated by bees for their honey. It then appears, however, that this hope is unrealistic. Capitalism, which is usually claimed to be a sign of modern civilization and rationality, is called modern madness in line 16. Instead of providing money to give life to those symbolized by flowers who journey across the mountains, the capitalist system snaps these flowers from their stems. If this image is interpreted as an allegory of apartheid-era travel, we can take it to mean a system that separates workers from their families, leaving them as dry and dead bodies. In line 18, the natural imagery is replaced by an urban image, a street, along which these dry and dead bodies walk. The implication is that the hopeful have been made into the walking dead. Please note that the word pass is problematic here. It could either be used as a verb with the cars that pass each other on their way to the mountain or it could be a noun. If a noun, then you would understand it as either a mountain pass, the road on which cars travel, or, and this is a bit of a stretch, that the poet is referring to the pass system that was enforced by the apartheid government when black people had to carry an identity document with them at all times or face arrest. Remember that at the beginning of this lesson, I said that there are no real contextual markers in the poem. The Dompas, as it was called, is a peculiarly South African document. That reference wouldn't make any sense to any other non-South African readers of the poem. This confusion around the word pass adds to the ambiguous nature of this poem. Take note of the devices used in this stanza, such as the figurative language with metaphors and a simile, the alliteration of the M and D sounds, the use of adjectives that focus attention on the incessant striving for wealth. The shortness of line 15, just three words, 
focuses our attention on the problem of our modern world. That is money. The final stanza summarizes the current situation. On the one hand, people's old wishes for hope have been bright, so bright as to be blinding. Equally bright is the promise of modern honey just across the mountains, which blinds people to the true nature of these wishes. This brightness is contrasted with the dark reality that the traveler encounters, which is full of wonder and yet saps his life for its own purposes. That, the speaker tells us, is where we are, faced with a hard choice between staying without work and money in a world that is lost, or conversely being lured into a world of wonder that is found, and yet also a place of dry, dead bodies. Either outcome is unsatisfactory, so the traveller is given no hope at all. The final two lines summarise that that's where we are, lost or found world. As indicated in the beginning, the word world invites the reader to consider whether this is a local or global phenomenon, whether this is the world of each person confined to the horizon of what they see around them, or the world in which we all live whether this system of economic exploitation is not merely a South African madness, but also a global one. Now that we've analysed the poem, how do you think that this image links with the text? Has the speaker lost something, found something, or is the speaker still searching? And what is he searching for? The truth? Soroti seems to reflect on the relations between one's local environment and global events, striving to gain some universal insight. Do you think this image is a better one to link with the poem? A more modern setting, asphalt roads with business people wondering which road they should select in order to make their way in the labyrinth. Does this link better to the concept of materialism, the madness of modern lifestyles dictated by our insatiable desire for the precious modern honey that is money? Where do you find yourself in this lost or found world? Time for some questions. In order to determine whether you have a good grasp of the poem, you need to be able to answer questions in writing. It's important that you write clearly, making your point, substantiating that point with evidence from the poem, analysing how your evidence proves your point, and using connectives to make the links in a logical and succinct manner. Be careful of waffling. Even good waffle is just waffle. Here are your five questions for lost or found world. You will see that you're asked to consider specific references, the structure of the first line of each stanza, and you are asked to discuss the ambiguity of the poem's title. Pause the video here and make the effort to write your answers to these questions. It's really important that you practice the writing of answers. For some reason, it's more difficult to capture your thoughts about abstract writing on paper than to discuss them or think about them. Set the clock and give yourself 20 minutes to complete this task. Are you done? I mean, really done? With well-structured answers to every question? With textual evidence to substantiate your points? 
Well, if that's the case, move on to the next slides and compare your answers with the suggested answers given to you. If you wink often, it suggests that you are nervous or that you're anxious. The speaker seems to be saying that he wishes to escape the harsh reality of the skies of truth that he sees every day. By winking or closing his eyes, he is able to escape or forget these skies, even if just for a short time. The sea of identity is a key image in the poem. Although you may refer to your knowledge of the poet's personal background, your answer should be rooted in the text itself. Prove your points by referring to specific words and phrases in the poem. You will note in this answer the numerous references to the natural surroundings, the sea, the shore, the sand and the wind you do need to write in this type of detail. This question should not be too difficult for you. When you are asked to look at the structure of a poem, it requires that you look at the technical aspects of the poem. Approach your answer in a logical fashion. Focus on the first lines of the stanzas see what they have in common and then consider why the poet has chosen to write in this structured way. And don't forget to state the obvious, such as the fact that the poet uses a metaphor in each of these lines. The key words here are literal and figurative. You should be able to explain the artery imagery in both ways. Your interpretation of the title determines your understanding of this poem. This is therefore a very important question. Take your time to build your answer. You'll find it quite challenging to write logically about concepts which seems so philosophical and nebulous even. Reread what you've written. Does it make sense to you? If not, it won't make sense to your examiner either. You should always attempt to pair a scene poem with another text. An obvious one for this poem is a lost and found box. What lands up in such boxes? When do you look in one? Only when an item is of value to you, perhaps? I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the words of the hymn Amazing Grace. In this well-known song, you'll sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found was blind, but now I see. How does this biblical concept tie in with this poem? Do you think that the speaker reaches a point of illumination, a point where he believes that he's found, he is saved? I don't mean saved in the Christian evangelical sense. I mean in the sense of coming to terms with his identity. The final text is a quote which poses questions about the power of writing, the power of words. Writers will often tell you that the process of writing, pouring their souls onto paper, is akin to spilling their blood, their essence, onto the page. It's a powerful quote. Read it carefully. Another way of asking you to apply your knowledge and understanding of this poem is to ask you a question which requires you to consider the poem in more broad or holistic terms. The poet Mungani Wali Sarote is South Africa's third poet laureate, appointed in 2018. 
This is a rare honour, giving recognition for decades of writing. What is it about his poetry that makes him a deserving recipient of this title? In your answer, you should refer extensively to the text of this poem, Lost or Found World. The screenshot on the right is taken from the online article published by Mail and Guardian to share the news of Sorotti's appointment. In the IEB examination, you will be examined on unseen poetry. Sometimes, the unseen poem is paired with a seen poem. Many of you will be familiar with this poem by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. Read it again carefully. How does the message of this poem link to Sirotti's poem? Which road will be the best one to travel? On which road will you be either lost or found. I hope that you found this video lesson helpful. If you did, please subscribe to the Mrs. M Teaches English YouTube channel and spread the word to your friends and colleagues at other schools. Together, we'll make getting through matric English easier, whether you're a teacher or a student.